Hello, my name is Carwin and I'm here today to tell you all a story that happened over 150 years ago. And it's a story about a man called William Jones. And I lived in Bala in North Wales, just outside Bala actually, on the Rhiwlas estate. And I lived there with my family. I had a wife called Catherine, we had a two-year-old daughter called Mary, and also a little baby called Jane. Catherine and I work very hard on the farm, but despite all our efforts, we are still very poor. These are bills, oh, all sorts of bills. The blacksmith's bill, the grocer's bill, the, the miller's bill. And as well as all these bills, we also have to pay rent to the local squire. He's our landlord. Now, his name is Mr. Richard W. Price, and he's a very, very nasty man. I paid him a visit last week. Mr. Price, I was hoping you would allow me to do some hunting on your land. Maybe some rabbit hunting or some fishing. Anything I can use to feed my family. No! I'm the only person who can hunt and fish here. Um, would you allow me to cut down one tree on your land so I can at least get some firewood together and keep my family warm? No! I'm the only person who can cut down trees. So I, I'm not allowed to hunt on your land? No. Uh, no, no fishing? No. And uh, I'm not allowed to cut down just one tree? No. These landlords make me very, very angry. They just make up their own rules as they go along, and I, the ordinary working man, have to pay the consequences. And I have no rights. If I complain to Mr. Price, he could then throw us out of our home. The situation is serious. <sighs> There's an advert in the local newspaper for the Welsh colony in Patagonia. Hmm. Yes, I, I remember a preacher came to our local chapel to talk to us about this a few weeks ago. What was his name? Michael D. Jones. Patagonia is basically the other side of the world. It's 7,000 miles away. It's part of Argentina, and Argentina is huge. Now, what Michael D. Jones is saying is the government of Patagonia are willing to give the Welsh people 100 acres of land for free. Yes, and it's very good land, very fertile land, he called it. And the weather in Patagonia, according to Michael D. Jones, is always sunny, which is great news for me as a farmer, of course. Uh, he said there are sheep in Patagonia once again. Very good news. I can shear the sheep and then sell the wool to make a bit of money. Yes, but how much does it cost? £36 for a family ticket, which is a lot of money. Having thought about it, is a pound cheaper than the rent I have to pay Mr Richard W Price every year? I only earn £53 in a whole year, which leaves me with... £16 to feed a family of four for a whole year, which is very, very difficult to do. Oh, I don't know. I haven't travelled seven miles, let alone 7,000 miles, and there's a very good chance I will not see my family or friends ever again. It's a big decision. However, Catherine and I have decided we are going for it. We are going to Patagonia. Now, everyone who went to Patagonia were given a crate like this to carry their possessions. Uh, what's in my crate? I have clothes in there, uh, also a sewing kit so I can mend my clothes. Uh, also, there's a copy of the Bible. Yes, everyone would have taken one of these with them. And also a picture of my family as I may never see them again. And to be honest, that's it. I had to sell everything else I owned in order to raise the funds to go to Patagonia. Now then, we are sailing to Patagonia from Liverpool Harbour, which is a 60 mile journey from Bala. Wow, what an adventure. Having traveled for 24 hours on horse and carriage, we finally arrived at Liverpool Harbour. And the harbour itself in 1865 was brand new. And there were people everywhere. Now then, 
There were 152 people like us travelling to Patagonia on a ship called the Halton Castle. Do you know how long we waited for the Halton Castle? A month. A whole month. And during that time, of course, we had to pay for food and accommodation. And having bought the ticket, we didn't have much money at all. But fair play to Michael D. Jones and his wife. They made other arrangements. And after a month, our ship finally arrived. The Mimosa. Now, the Mimosa usually carried tea, not people, but a few changes were made which made it a bit more comfortable. So finally, on the 28th of May 1865, the Welsh flag was hoisted aloft, the Mimosa. Farewell, Liverpool! Farewell, family and friends! Farewell, Wales! It's a long journey to Patagonia. I'm just writing a bit in my diary. It's uh, June the 1st, and I've been feeling a bit seasick up until now, but thankfully today the weather has improved. I'm sat here looking at the vast, endless sea in front of me. Wow, what a sight. And I've started to eat more now as well, I'm feeling a bit better. Although the food situation is pretty bleak. We have one piece of bread every day, but it's more like a piece of wood. I have to eat this, but at least I don't have to drink lemon juice. Every crew member has to drink lemon juice to fight off diseases like scurvy. June the 9th. We've been at sea now for nearly two weeks and several people have been ill during this time. But today was the saddest day, as a two-year-old girl from Bangor died. June the 11th. Here I am on the deck again, looking out at the sea again. It's becoming a bit boring now, but uh, today there was, however, cause for celebration, as a baby was born to Mr and Mrs John Jones. And to celebrate, Instead of our usual piece of bread, today we were given two pieces of bread, yes. But um, Mary, our two-year-old daughter, wasn't feeling well today. She didn't eat much. June 16th, well, there was commotion on board the ship this morning as the captain rounded up all the girls on board as he thought at least one of them had knits. And what the captain wanted to do to solve this problem was to cut the girl's hair off. Well, there was screaming, there were angry protests from these girls' parents, until eventually the captain decided not to cut their hair off, as long as each one of them was inspected for nits. And you know what? They didn't find nits on any of them. So, a bit of a waste of time really, wasn't it, captain? Today was a very exciting day on board the Mimosa. There was a wedding ceremony. So congratulations to William Hughes and Anne Lewis. July the 26th. It's been almost two months since we left Liverpool Harbour. And today was the day the captain said we might see Patagonia for the first time from a distance. So what happened? Lookout went to the top of a crow's nest with his telescope to see if the captain was indeed correct. And we all shouted up, look out, look out, can you see Patagonia? And he could. The captain was right. We were almost there. July the 28th. The Mimosa drops anchor in Patagonia. We've arrived and all the other passengers are very, very happy. But it's sadness that fills my heart and Catherine's. Because having been ill for a month on board the Mimosa. Our two-year-old daughter, Mary, died. And our first day in Patagonia was filled with sadness as we laid her to rest. The first from Wales to be buried on this land. And to make matters worse, a few days later, Jane, our baby daughter, 
also died from disease. Although it was summertime back home in Wales, we'd arrived in Patagonia right in the middle of winter, and Michael D. Jones hadn't prepared us for this at all. It was cold, it was damp, and the winds just chilled us to the bone. And there was no sign of this fertile, green, luscious land that Michael D. Jones had promised us. Just barren land as far as the eye could see. But we were determined to make this work, so what we did, we gathered all our belongings and travelled about 30 miles inland to a place called the Chibut Valley. Having arrived at the Djibut Valley, the first thing we did was we built canals. Now the purpose of these canals was to have the water flow straight from the Djibut River into this barren land. And gradually the fresh river water would turn the barren land into fertile land. And we were then able to farm successfully on it. Now then, we quickly realised in the Djibut Valley that we weren't alone. There were other people living there already. We weren't expecting this. These people were, of course, the Indians. Now then, we didn't know if these people were nice people or not. And in turn, of course, they had no idea if we, the Welsh people, were nice or not. But after a short amount of time, we realised that we were able to be friends. Now then, what these Indians were very good at doing was hunting, right? Hunting animals for food. And some of the animals they hunted was the puma. Another animal they hunted would be the armadillo. And another one would be this animal here, which looks very much like a llama or an alpaca. But this animal is called a guanaco. And the Indians would then give the Welsh people these animals for food. Now then, do you know how much money the Indians wanted for these animals? Well, I'll tell you, no money at all. Nope. What they wanted as payment was our bread. Bara in Welsh, of course, because the Indians had never tasted bread in their lives. And the minute that they did, they loved it. And do you know what they called bread? Bara bara. Yep. They liked it so much, they said it twice. In time, Catherine and I established our own farm called a betol. And after that, we had more children. We had six children, in fact. And Patagonia then became our home. And neither of us returned to Wales ever again. And that is the story of William Jones. Now, there are people to this day who live in Patagonia who can speak Welsh, even though they live 7,000 miles away. And they're very proud of their Welsh roots and heritage. There are Welsh schools over in Patagonia, and they even hold an Eisteddfod. And every year, on the 28th of July, they celebrate the landing, Gwyl y Glaniad, to commemorate those people who travelled from Wales to Patagonia in 1865.